Hope everybody enjoyed their coffee break. Um, we are gonna keep moving on. We have two more exciting panels ahead. Um, and I wanna briefly introduce our next panel here, uh, Disrupting Polarization, Understanding Disinformation. Um, as you can tell by the conversation we've already had today in our prior two panels, this is an issue that's been around for a long time, um, whether it was the rumors going around in ancient Greece or fake news we see today. Um, the next panel is going to help us understand this phenomena a little bit more and showcase the types of issues that our institute plans to research and address, bringing together multiple perspectives on a single topic. Um, so let me introduce the panel now. Um, Gary Kasparov is going to be our moderator, and he will bring the other panelists on stage and introduce them one by one. Thanks. So, um, good morning. So, we'll talk about this information, and um, I think first we'll have to define the term. So, why, after not hearing this word for so many years, so it's all it's making this powerful comeback, and uh, so we should understand it's because of this internet, new tools, or changing the political climate, and hopefully within this very short period of time, 45 minutes, with this great panel, we'll be able just to um, to shed some light. Um, on um, this problem. Um, so, I, uh, um, um, speaking about, about uh, disinformation and fake news, I, I cannot ignore the fact that uh, it probably the, the, it was, it was in the, it, the industrial concept came out of my, of my country, of, from Russia. So, uh, we even joke that in Russia we have a special term for fake news. It's called news. <laughs> um, uh, and and uh, recently we saw that even in the most uh, 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 powerful advanced democracy in the world, the United States, this, the fake news concept worked. So we took uh, 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 one, one uh, Twitter account and one uh, cable, cable uh, news channel and uh, half of the Republican Party, if not more, now likes Vladimir Putin and hates FBI and believes that Kim Jong-un has been misunderstood. So why, why it's all happening? So we'll, we'll try to, to start analyzing it and just uh, not on analyzing, but also talking about possible solutions. So we'll um, start with Emily Falk, who's an expert on analyzing. So why, it's, uh, uh, why the fake news are making uh, such a strong impact on our brains. Emily. Thank you. Thanks for having me. My name is Emily Falk, and I direct the Communication Neuroscience Lab at Penn. And we try to study how successful communication works in the brain. And we do that both from the point of view of what people decide to share and what makes them successful in convincing other people that some ideas are good ideas and some ideas are not good ideas. And then we also look at receivers and what happens when people are becoming persuaded. So just to give you a little bit of a sense of what I mean by each of those things, in one recent study we looked at people's brain responses to New York Times health section headlines and teasers. So we looked at what happened in their brains when they were exposed to each of a number of different headlines and teasers from the New York Times health section. And specifically, we focused on parts of the brain that help people decide how valuable and self-relevant information is to them. And what we found was that when we saw more activity in those brain regions in response to the New York Times headlines, people were more likely to want to share that information with other people. And then maybe more powerfully, what we found is when we looked at the aggregate brain activity of a small number of people in Philadelphia, so groups of 40 people, we could forecast large-scale outcomes. So we looked at the New York Times website gives access 
information objectively about how much different articles are downloaded and shared around the world. And we found that brain activity in this small group of people helped us understand which kinds of articles were likely to be spread around the globe. Then on the other side, we've also looked at people's brain activity when they're being exposed to things like public service campaigns, so anti-smoking messages, physical activity messages, messages that are trying to get people to behave in different ways. And we care about that a lot because these kinds of decisions have major implications for our longevity, for our well-being. And so what we've done is looked at what happens in people's brains when they're exposed to these kinds of messages. And again, activity in this value system, the system that helps you decide, would I rather eat an apple or an orange or compare different kinds of possible routes that you could take, more activity translates into greater behavior change that's consistent with the messages. And in that context also, looking at what happens in the brains of small groups of people can tell us useful information about what happens at large scale. So one additional example, when we looked at brain responses to anti-smoking campaigns, we found that the brain responses of a small group of people accurately forecasted which of the campaign messages would be most effective, whereas when we asked people what they thought would be effective and ineffective, um, they, they got it wrong. And so sometimes we can get what we think of as maybe like hidden wisdom from the brain. So information that people don't necessarily have conscious access to or choose not to tell us when we ask them, sometimes their brains um, can reveal. And so most relevant to this panel, we're starting to look at whether these same kinds of fundamental decision processes, the same kinds of fundamental things that happen in people's brains, also apply when we're talking about false versus true news, for example, or when people are being exposed to civic information. And how can we make civic information more appealing, more useful for people to share and engage in dialogue, while also understanding how we can curb the spread of false news. Now, Deborah also uh, had plenty of experience in analyzing uh, um, yeah, this data, and uh, now she's currently uh, running the uh, Social uh, Machines Lab at MIT. Thank you. So I'll just mention one study we did that's directly on this topic. Uh, we published, uh, this is with Sanan Aral and Surush Fasugi, um, a study of the spread of contested news uh, on Twitter. And this was the cover of Science Magazine in March of this year. And what we did in a nutshell is scrape six major fact-checking sites uh, built a database of every story that they had fact-checked uh, in their history, so several thousand stories, and then looked across the entire history of Twitter, going back to the beginning of the, um, the company's uh, archives, and built a database of Twitter retweet cascades. So every time one of those contested stories was retweeted, we would look at um, the trees of how they would, um, an initial pointer to a story would then be repeated, uh, sometimes fanning out uh, through many different um, uh, threads of retweets, and asked a very simple question. When you categorize true versus false stories based on the fact checker's uh, categorization, is there any difference in how uh, true versus false story spread? And um, the answer is uh, astonishingly clear that false stories um, spread faster, they go further, um, and the difference is not even subtle. And when we then looked at um, why is it that false stories go further, and remember uh, the assumption here is often when someone is hitting the retweet button, they don't know whether the story is true or false. They're just reading it and then in the moment hitting the retweet button, when we looked at the reply sequences to these um, tweets and retweets, um, encoded them for emotion, to look for is there any emotions in the reactions to the stories that correlate with the, uh, the, the truth or falsity of the story, we found disgust and surprise were elevated in the case of stories that turned out to be false. Um, so it sort of makes sense as a causal story there that's suggestive, which is um, we're moved by certain emotions in the story, and uh, if the story is made up, uh, it's fake, it's easier to be surprising because you're not tethered to reality and apparently if you add a, a touch of disgust, you've got 
a, uh, a winning combination for a story that's more likely to be uh, spread. So, you know, the story of um, a distant intermediated um, spread of news where um, you have now in the hands of millions the decision of what to publish in a sense um, in this kind of decentralized network leads to, uh, in this case, a pretty concerning um, effect. And one thing just to, because we, we talked briefly about bots, we did pretty aggressive analyses uh, to remove what looked like bots from the data. And even when we remove literally 90% of all the accounts on suspicion they may be bots, the remaining 10%, uh, the patterns I just described held. So we do believe this is primarily being driven by humans, not bots. Bots are certainly a growing effect, but there's been an arms race lately. Um, one, one comment I'll make about uh, something as we're talking about actions that um, we uh, have been now focusing on building experiments with new kinds of networks. And I'll just say in summary that we think going local is actually critical. And one of the fundamental elements of not just Twitter, but the internet, um, is that it's not anchored in place. And there's a lot more to be said about this, but we are doing experiments in building new kinds of digital networks powered by machine learning, et cetera, but that are rooted in physical place and that build on casual physical interactions between people and have that as the, the basis for creating new forms of networks uh, that we think is, um, uh, we're not done in building social networks. Twitter has certain positive and negative uh, affordances. And um, so that's shifted us into an action mode in, in creating new kinds of networks. Um, Anna Pelbaum, uh, a columnist of for Washington Post, and uh, also she runs a disinformation program for London School of Economics. Thank you. Um, I've actually been working on Russian disinformation and disinformation campaigns for several years. And one of the things that happens um, when, you, when you focus on how exactly it works, why exactly people believe it, why exactly people pass on information, whether it's false or true, because disinformation campaigns often include the use of true information, but twisted or framed in a, in a particular way. And that's one of the reasons they're so difficult to analyze. Um, one of the conclusions that you come to very quickly is that the problem lies in the nature of the internet, in the ease with which people create false identities, um, and so on. So I have a lot of empathy with the kind of work that you're doing. I think reconstructing the social networks and the platforms with this in mind um, could make a big difference. Um, in the meantime, I'll just describe one of the projects that we're doing at the London School of Economics, because one of the conclusions that we came to was that, um, or, or we began to, we thought we would investigate, was whether it's possible to uh, reverse engineer some of the damage that social networks do, and some of the, in particular, some of the ways in which they divide up different kinds of audiences. So, and we're, we, I'm a journalist, and my um, partner in this project, Peter Pomerantsev, is also a journalist. Um, and so we thought about how could journalism begin to think differently? So could, rather than um, producing one story and sending it out to reach all audiences with the, ex with the expectation that everybody would read it in the same way, what if uh, a newspaper or a, or a we unfortunately now have to call them content providers, which is uh, an, an awkward expression. But what if a newspaper thought in terms of its different audiences and was able to frame articles or true stories in different ways? And we are hoping to conduct similar, several kinds of experiments like that. The first one we're running actually in Italy. We're working with Corriere della Sera, the most important Italian newspaper, and with an Italian computer scientist who's helping us understand audiences in Italy. And the newspaper is producing articles about particular real events, but framing them or casting them or designing them in different ways. So either as a narrative, as a personal story, using facts, using data, using graphics, using video, using different ways of writing um, in order to see, and then testing those different kinds of writing with different audiences to see how they react to it. Um, the goal of this eventually is to come up with a kind of, is, to, is ideally to run it in several places, um, but ideally is to come up with a set of tools or, or kind of toolbox or advice for journalists to have them 
to have journalists also think about who are their different audiences. So I work at the Washington Post. I know this is already done in a kind of primitive way with headlines. The Washington Post now experiments with different headlines on articles to see whether the different headlines can reach different audiences. But what if we also started to think about content in different ways too? Um, this I think is important for even for journalists as a, you know, as a kind of mental exercise to have them begin to think about how different audiences read what they write, how they perceive differently. And I think it's the beginning of what will be a long process of, of reinterpreting what we mean by the news and what we mean by writing and producing news. Thank you, Anne. Uh, Diego Chuli, um, Google Global Project analyzing, uh, but also uh, um, uh, finding ways how to fight back. Thank you, thank you for having me here. It's really an honor and pleasure having the opportunity to discuss this information with you, but um, I will start from what we do at Google. Well, actually, why, uh, why we were created and why we were so successful. The, reason, the very reason of the success of Google is that there was a lot of information. It was something new in the history of humans because we used to consider information as scarce, good, and then uh, with the internet, a lot of information became available. And the key of our success was to design an algorithm that helped people find the right piece of information in the right moment. <laughs> this has a lot to do with what we are discussing, discussing today. Because, of course, the, the early days of Google uh, had more to do to researching an academic paper or uh, the weather forecast. But now we are in a world in which the source of news the source of uh, actual information is uh, so widespread uh, that the key skills that people need is no more uh, knowing how to access information. That were the skills that every one of us basically has learned at school. Now the key skill for uh, citizens is uh, to navigate uh, in uh, a huge amount of news and understanding what is true and what is false. We think that uh, we should address it two ways. The first one is uh, at the core of our job, uh, actually, as a technology provider. So uh, the first search engine uh, was successful because help people uh, find the correct information to their answer in the form of a query. Now the challenge for a company that wants to organize information is also to help people uh, finding trustable information. And that's the reason why we are working on a number of technological processes to teach our algorithm and work with our partners in the news industry to uh, reach their targets. On the other side, I think we should redefine from scratch the notion of media literacy. Because uh, our students, well, just an anecdote, uh, I used to be a politician before working at Google. What used to happen to me for real is that when a newspaper attacked me for any reason, uh, my grandmother called me and asked me, what did you do? Why, why did you do that? And I, if I said I didn't do that, she answered, I read it on the newspaper. <laughs> well, uh, I was in a conference like this uh, two months ago, and uh, I asked to 100 students what were their primary source of information. They answered their friends. Something deep has changed. We do think at Google that we should help traditional and trustable information to reach their users. And the other way to do this is to educate them on how to access quality information. So, and then we will discuss further, but we are really working on the idea that the web could be an to the bank fake news, not just to spread them. Good. Uh, now, uh, there's so many questions here already, and uh, actually I had some on mine, but uh, uh, they are, you know, it's, that's exactly what I wanted to ask. Let's start with one that you know, goes to all the panel. Um, so, and uh, it's being repeated a few times. Um, I can read one, but it's just uh, basically it's the... Uh, it, <laughs> One is asking, what's the difference between misinformation, disinformation, and fake news? Do we believe that any? So just very briefly, so again, people want to, want to understand the term better. Misinformation, disinformation, fake news. And 
you. I, so these are some, some of these are words that are used in, in different ways. I, I would say the best way to understand, and this is not my original idea, but one of the best ways to understand disinformation is that there are several different levels of it. Um, and there are sort of different levels of falseness. So, for example, we can speak at one of the most basic level about false identities. Um, and this is something you can create a fake personage, or, you know, a fake identity on Facebook or on, on Twitter or somewhere else on social media. Um, there's then a second level, which is false amplification. Um, so you can then create ways of amplifying falsely that person's views or that bot's views. Um, and so on. There's a, there's, a, there's a third level, which is fake news. These are actually invented stories, which are then pushed by the fake people or the fake amplification. And then there's a kind of fourth level, which is a disinformation campaign, which are organized um, over different, you know, which can be organized over different platforms um, over time. So there are, you know, there are different, um, you know, there, there, there are different, there are different levels in a way of, of falseness. Um, one of the other distinctions you have to make is why people are engaging in fake news. There are people who do it because they're spreading rumors. There are people who do it for ideological reasons. There are people who do it for financial reasons. Um, and sorting through the different kinds of misinformation, I think, also requires you to understand something about the motives of the people doing it as well. So, I mean, I think I, I, the, if the sense of the question is, you know, what are we talking about and how do we define it, um, I think we need to start with, um, you know, at a, almost a couple of levels back and look at, you know, which level, what are the motives, um, and which, you know, which kinds of news are easiest to control and which ones are going to be more difficult. I mean, for example, it's obviously much more easy to control or set rules around um, n false news, which is being created for financial reasons, because you can remove the financial incentive. Um, it may be much easier to deal with fake identities, you know, because then you can eliminate bots, for example. Um, at a higher level, you know, you, must, you might need a different kind of conversation to deal with it. So I think that's a helpful way to think about categorizing what we mean. I, I, just, I just wanted to add, I think that's a wonderful answer. Just one quick addition to the list of motivations, which is um, unwittingly right. sharing something that sure. you think is true which may be a, a substantial part of what's happening. Um, so clearly the story, when you read it and it's contested, turns out to be false, someone intentionally constructed something to mislead. But then it might be in some cases that the vast majority of people who shared it uh, didn't realize they were supporting a, a falsity. They were actually... Uh, or, or, a, or a campaign designed to create right. impressions. Yeah, and it's that decentralized control of who decides what gets shared. The, your, your comment about the friends being the source, um, that the, the training of an editorial board and, and other mechanisms to control dissemination um, have been washed away. Well, the, just a quick other. I very much agree with this distinction. I think that in all this debate, we should pay a lot of attention in preserving the right to lie. So i pretty scared on the idea that somebody should control if what I say, say is right or wrong if I'm lying, because lies have always exist and are a key part of our democracy. It's important to address disinformation. That's pretty different. And disinformation, in my opinion, is when a series of lies are created for a goal. And from this point of view, it's far easier to address the goal. On one side, there is political propaganda and geostrategic propaganda. That's something very complex uh, to address. On the other side, and raised it, it's money. So we know that is, fake news is an industry, and uh, investing on uh, polarization is an industry to take out money. And most of that money comes out of advertising. So we are becoming very radical. You know that Google is also a provider of advertising for blogs and websites that make money by placing ads. And we are reviewing our policies and trying to be very aggressive on demonetizing, so not allowing to, for websites that are created to spread false information to make money out of that. It's incredibly challenging because it's very difficult to understand which ones are this, but uh, I want to make this point very clear. Can I ask you, would you, 
Because very often dealing with the disinformation campaign by the time it's a campaign, I agree, is very difficult because it's hard to define. What do you at Google think about going down to the lower level and looking at false identities, websites created under false, um, uh, you know, under, under false pretenses? You know, what if you made things transparent at a much lower level? Would that then make it easier to deal with this higher level of disinformation campaigns? Yeah, that's... Do you understand what I'm asking? Yes, I understood. That's an incredibly important problem uh, that for us is a bit less relevant because we, we don't have a big social network. That's incredibly relevant. False identity is an incredibly relevant problem for social networks because you always have to take a balance between uh, the uh, quality and the uh, fight against false identities. On the other side, the preservation of anonymity that has been one of the key pillars that has helped the internet of being a tool for dissidents and not ordinary ideas to be spread. But this said, we have very strict policies against false identities, and we try to remove that in particular with Google Plus, who was a social network that was designed around two identities. On the other side, and it's not on the actual identity, but it's on the credibility of the websites, we have tried, we are training actually our machine learning system and our human trainers to try to understand when a website is accountable or not. And in particular in Google News, we include only news organizations that are accountable, so that list who the publishers are, list who the authors are. The very idea of keeping separate the search engine from Google News is this. The search engine has to do with freedom of information. Google News is news, so it has to be controlled. Uh, since you have a mic, so the one question is directed to you. Do search engines have an ethical responsibility to promote factual news over uh, uh, popular news? I don't understand what's the difference. Yes. Yeah, I, that's question. I'm radical on this too, and I think no, yeah. because yeah. Uh, I'm also scared of search engines with ethical responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think search engines have a transparency responsibility. That's very yeah. different. Good. We try to be transparent on how we rank sources. That's a small part of what I just said, but it's a, a 60 pages paper on how we rank sources. But what I think it's very important for search engine to make transparent how they rank sources on the other side and on, on the other is to make an as clear as possible distinction between uh, the search on the, f the results on the free web and the s s results coming from uh, uh, news organizations. And on the other side, that's never obvious enough, the difference between results that are paid, that's advertising, and results that are free. Yeah. Emily, question for you. Um, could your research findings be used in ways that may not be good for democracy by media organizations to maximize their metrics? Sure. So that's a question that comes up a lot. And um, I think the answer is certainly that any kind of technology can be used with different kinds of motives. Um, when we think about this question, the way we think about it is that it's important for it to happen in the public domain, for people to know what's possible and not possible. So for example, private organizations or political organizations can do things you know, in the basement of their organization and they don't have any um, legal responsibility to say what they are doing or are not doing. Whereas in a university context funded by public dollars, we publish in the public domain how we do this kind of work, what we think is possible, um, and we try to focus it on, to the best of our ability, pro-social ends. So in my lab, we do a lot of work on things like health campaigns, and as I mentioned, we're starting to think about some of these questions about false news. Um, but certainly understanding these kinds of processes can, can cut both ways. Yes, uh, just following up this. One of the main things that political science students are taught at college is to check, verify their sources. Like engineers are taught to build bridges. So how can people uh, spot the fake news? So is it just failed endeavor or what? And also, uh, it's a question to you, Emily. Um, 
the importance of critical thinking. So we heard about it so, uh, in the previous panel. That's, and the humans not being driven by emotions, but interpreting and acknowledging the value of a piece of news based on reason. So uh, can you provide that in any insights on educational strategies for the citizens of the future to have the skills necessary to deal with a massive flow of news? Because this is one of the, one of the another question is, uh, how can we sort of find a, sort of find a pass with so much news, so with, with, with a flood of news? So there are a number of questions built yeah, into yeah, what I you just, just asked. I, I'm just um, to I'll share them. a couple of different kind of recent insights from work that we've done. So one is when we look at what happens in people's brains that are exposed to information, and we ask the question of whose brains are most predictive of large-scale outcomes, the answer is that it kind of depends how the person's using their brain. So, for example, in the New York Times study that I mentioned earlier, um, on average, if we looked at the brain activity in these 40 people, that was predictive of large-scale population-level sharing of the New York Times articles. But not everybody's brains are equally predictive. And in some recent work that um, one of my postdocs, a guy named Bruce Doré, has been working on, what he finds is that when people start to bring this top-down reasoning online in their minds, that their brains actually get less predictive of the large-scale response. So when they're using primarily kind of emotional inputs, let's say, to the value calculation, like how valuable would it be to act on this information or to assess the value of the message, then that tends to be more predictive of the large-scale population response, whereas there are parts of your brain and in your prefrontal cortex that kind of modulate that are those kind of critical thinking things. And to the extent that people are bringing those regions online, that's more associated with their own idiosyncratic goals um, and therefore is less predictive of the large-scale response. And so I guess what I would say is that there seems to be some kind of commonality in our gut-level responses to things, whereas when we start to think about it, that's where some of the most important interactions happen, but also what makes our thinking about things different. And so I'd like to add just one more thing following up on what, what Anne brought up about um, message tailoring and um, you know what makes people good at convincing other people. So tied to the same kind of process of reasoning and the idea that different people are going to come to different kinds of conclusions, in other work that we've done, what we've found is that brain systems that help us understand other people's minds. So if I'm thinking about what Deb's thinking, I'm thinking about what Anne's thinking, there's parts of my brain that are more active, that help me simulate and understand their thoughts and feelings. And those are the parts of our brains that are um, most commonly important when we're trying to be a good idea salesperson. So understanding what your audience thinks may be one of the most important kinds of skills. And so that's more and more challenging as we're in these isolated spaces where we talk to people who think like we think. Um, and so having access to information about how other people are thinking about it, how they're reasoning about it, can maybe be one of the answers to that question. I, I know it's obviously yeah. very complicated. Can I also respond? Yes. yes. Yeah. Just yeah, would. Go ahead. Two, two quick things. One is uh, an experience we had. I organized a seminar last year at MIT called Depolarization by Design. And we had a group of students from Harvard and MIT um, discussing different ways to understand the, the drivers of depolarization. There's a lot of, we had, you know, moral psychologists and legal scholars and so forth come and, and lead discussions. But one of the most uh, interesting uh, weeks was when we actually didn't have a speaker, so we came up with an activity. We asked our students to spend a week every day reading stories about a specific topic, an event that was occurring at the time. There's some, something happening in, uh, in, in the Trump administration. Um, and we picked Washington Post and New York Times, Fox News, um, and I think it was Breitbart to follow these events. And the surprise for our liberal-leaning class was how much of the content on Fox was actually correct. Um, and some of the biases actually across the board, not just of the, the sources they usually didn't read, but the others. So one part, just um, learning to expose yourself to other sources. It doesn't take long to start to realize that there are certain filters in place uh, across the board. 
Um, that so that kind of an exercise. I'll just stop there. That's sort of a. Um, it, it didn't take long for our students to to understand. Actually, I, I want to say one other thing about YouTube, which is um, there was a very interesting article written about how the algorithm for YouTube suggests what to watch next. I and saw that uh, and yeah. I was talking to a friend who had his um, I think 12 or 13 year old kid read this, and he reported, so this is a data point of one, how immediately this kid, in realizing, hey, I'm being manipulated, um, internalized, and every time he would see the suggested what to watch next on YouTube, um, had this, we call it media literacy, like, hey, I'm, I'm, it's trying to, I know what it's trying to do to me. Um, how do you find that set of uh, kind of easy to understand elements of how our media environment works? and get that across because um, people don't want to be manipulated, yeah. but if they don't understand yeah, the rules. Uh, okay, by the next question, just you know, goes back to you. How can you tell the difference between a real person or a bot? Sorry? How can you tell the difference between a real person or a bot? Yeah. Can it, you? So, I, I think it's a incredibly difficult distinction to make because it's assuming there's a binary difference that there's bots and there's people. Um, what happens when you create tools to let people automate their social media activities? Um, if I build a tool that I can program when my tweet's going to go out later in the day, is that a human or a bot? Sounds like a human with a little machine assist. What if I want, actually following up on your suggestion, <clears throat> fast forward a few years in your project, and I have a tool that says, here's the message I want to send, but please rewrite it to um, connect with these different audiences and send those out later in the day. Is that a bot or not? Uh, and one can keep telling more and more, uh, these are not made up examples, these exist today. So it's a really hard distinction. I love your suggestion of, this was, you, you suggested for Google to have this lower level um, of knowing what, who different sources are. Um, and, you, you know, your answer was, well, we, it's not really a social network, but when Google is surfacing um, answers to queries, knowing who wrote that scientific paper or who wrote that article, and that is a, a journalist with some kind of a track record versus not, um, yeah, I think it's a very interesting question. Yeah, I, I, I even had another idea. You know, sometimes when you download a website, you'll get a little message saying, beware, this website might contain malware. You know, you can download it if you want, but be very careful. What if when you got to a website that had an unclear author, you know, who is unregistered or we don't really know who it is, you also got a little message saying, beware, this is an unclear, we don't know the origins of this website, read it at your risk. In other words, you can, it's still legal, you can read it, you know, no one's banning anything, nobody's doing any censorship, but what if it was possible to flag um, you know, sources that are unclear or that haven't registered or that aren't, you know, what, what, if, what if it was possible just within a, to create a kind of legal framework that registered and at least so that we would know what's real, what's not real, where things origin, where, what, who, what are they connected to? And there are a few questions that uh, I try to combine them because there's so many. Just back to you, Anne. So uh, it's about uh, traditional media and uh, the couple of questions uh, um, uh, asking uh, if uh, traditional media using the same um, sensationalism to sell newspapers because they address their own tribe, quote unquote, uh, to, su uh, to survive. And also um, speaking about your, uh, your experiment in Italy, so asking whether it's more, um, it would be more useful to look for the opposite newspapers promoting the same stories. Um, and the, again, the, the big question is, so, is this crisis a result of the loss of trust for media seen as representatives of an establishment? So um, it is true that today the way that a lot of traditional media companies have now learned, are beginning to learn rather, to make money online, because if I should, maybe I should step back a couple of paces and remind everybody that one of the sources of crisis for traditional media is that it's not that people aren't reading it, actually a lot of people are reading it, but their business model has disappeared. And their business model disappeared because Facebook took it, because Craigslist took away 
um, uh, small advertisements for all kinds of reasons, the internet destroyed the business model. And so therefore, much of the rethinking of traditional media has been, okay, so how do we make money in this new world? How do we stay alive? How do we pay for our journalists? How do we pay for editors? How do we pay for fact checking? Um, and so on. And one of the, the obvious ways to do it is to create the sense that a traditional newspaper is a kind of club. Um, and anybody who reads the New York Times and looks at its lifestyle pages knows that this is what they do. So you are a member of the New York Times clubs, you drink cappuccino, you go on cruises in the Greek islands, you know, you can see who their advertising is aimed at, you can see what the sort of lifestyle, you know, impression of the New York Times is. Um, I'm exaggerating, forgive me for New York Times readers and reporters in the room, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just exaggerating a little bit to make a point here. Um, and I work for the Washington Post, which you could accuse the same, you could say, you could say the same thing. So, the, so then the question is, is that, since this is now a way in which, you know, you need to, you need to recreate your market and, and people are doing it by creating a sort of identity, is this damaging to democracy for exactly the reason that you, you know, that some of the, the questioners imply? Um, are you therefore leaving out opposite points of view, people who don't belong to this social class or, or who don't identify with cappuccino drinking, Greek island visiting New York Times readers? Um, and the purpose of our, um, of my, my Corriera project is precisely to see if even within an establishment newspaper we can, we can seek to reach anti-establishment or counter-establishment um, people by writing or, you know, or framing um, in different ways. It may be that the answer is no, and it may be that the answer is, you know, Corriere can't do it, but I don't know, Cinque Stella can, or, or somebody, some, some counter person can. Or it may be that, um, uh, you know, that, because quite a, lot of, uh, quite a lot of what makes people believe or not believe people, things has to do with authority figures and who is quoted and who is, you know, so if you could find, I mean, for example, one of the examples that's, that we're looking at in Italy is there's a lot of trust right now for the Pope in Italy. Um, there's a lot of belief in the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church has a very different refugee policy from the Northern League. Um, it seeks to, you know, to, to, to promote compassion. Um, so is it possible to quote church leaders and attempt or use church headlines or reach people who admire or see the church as an authority and bring them into Corriera articles? Is there a way, in other words, is there a way to reach out of the Corriera club to other social classes and groups and somehow include them in the, in the conversation? So, I mean, if the sense of the question is, you know, are these organizations, you know, establishment, you know, the answer is yes. Part of that's now how they make their money. Um, is there a way they could spread beyond their obvious social class or their obvious readership? Um, I don't know, but it's one of the things um, to take into consideration. Um, yeah, the questions are keep, there, there are more yes. answers. But it's keep coming. We only have five Diego, minutes. one tough one for you. So this is, don't try to answer this one. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's often asserted that Google is an advertising company given its revenue base. So what's the relationship of advertising messaging to misinformation? I didn't understand. What's the relationship? M b of advertising messaging to misinformation. Um, yeah, and also, uh, uh, just it's the, another one, Can I just have to, um, yeah, uh, it's about the power of, uh, of, um, of uh, Google uh, and lack of the democratic transparency. Well, uh, thank you, <laughs> our questions. So the first one on advertising, uh, I really don't see much of our relationship in using uh, advertising to spread uh, false information for the quite simple reason that's uh, expensive. <laughs> and so we have seen that, we have seen that in particular in political campaigns uh, and in targeted advertising for political campaign that Honestly, I think this is fairly overestimated because what we see is that the uh, false information, the information strategy are largest based on uh, using network of users or of bots of that difficult distinction to spread uh, natural results rather than buying advertising for uh, spreading false information. What we see, and I covered this briefly before, is using advertising as a source of revenues 
to pay for search news. It's the phenomenon of clickbaiting. So you create uh, uh, a website uh, talking bad and spreading false news about refugees and immigrants just as a tool to drive traffic on this website because people will share it and you will make money with the advertising. On, this, on, the, on both points, we are, we are addressing both points. On the other side, uh, on paying for advertising, it's pretty easy because uh, advertising is fairly controlled. So it's uh, quite, and uh, it's complicated and we could organize a workshop on this, but <laughs> advertising on Google is based on the quality of the ads and of the quality of the page of destination. And uh, advertisers bet on which ads each one will see. Uh, quality of, of the ads. Will see, yes. So, quality of the ads. Quality of the ads <laughs> and the quality of the destination page. So. Uh, it's far more likely that uh, if both advertisers offer me one euro, that I see the ad of a trusted source and a quality source rather than a low quality one. Uh, but it's not the key of the issue. The other one is uh, uh, using advertising as a driver for making money and to create an industry of false news. That's the issue that we are trying to address okay. because it's bad for our uh, network. Uh, so. Um Time is running up, so uh, I have to apologize. I needed all the questions about education, uh, early stage or higher education, because it takes too much time to answer. But there's a final question, please, you know, 30 seconds just to, to, to answer this question. And please, you know, just uh, a grain of optimism. Do we witness the Orwellian dystopia, which is described in detail in 1984? Do we, are we witnessing now the Orwellian dystopia? from 1984, so no, 30 uh, seconds, please, you know, 30 seconds is, uh, grain of optimism. No, definitely no. We are in a terrible transitional phase in which people are used to have few information and trust them, and now they, are, they have much more freedom. They have just to learn to navigate, but we will live in a much better world in a, a few okay. years. Okay, so I'll, amp I'll amplify that and say there's good news and bad news, and the bad news is that right now we're at the stage right after the invention of the printing press when the monasteries lost their monopoly on information and suddenly everybody was a publisher and everybody was a writer and the Catholic Church broke up and the Reformation happened and we had a hundred years of civil war. Um, but the, you know, there is an end to the civil war and we get to the enlightenment and we work out religious tolerance and we fix it. And everything, so it's, 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 it's happening at accelerating speed now, yes? And now it will happen okay, at accelerating Not hundred years, we have just a few more few years. We hope. <laughs> Yeah, I have a very similar point of view, which is things are definitely moving faster than ever, but we just have to recognize that much of the social impact that we're now feeling of a new generation of technology also demonstrates the affordances of technology and thinking about design, and that design matters, and as we design new layers of technology, you can't put the genie back in the bottle, but we're not done with creating infrastructure and, uh, and creating tools by which we connect and interact. And the, the idea that control and the control of information and knowledge has been decentralized, there's a lot of positives to that. It's, uh, if you just look at all the utopian uh, uh, reasons that drove the early days of the internet, I don't think those reasons have been invalidated. We're just understanding that there is absolutely a dark side and a complex picture that's emerged. Um, Emily? I think we have choices about this. I think right now is a really key moment in terms of whether we choose to show up, whether we choose to try to understand the other side, whether we choose to engage in dialogue, whether we engage in all kinds of civic activities. And so, um, you know, being here is maybe one little spark of that. And then when we go home, you know, as Dev mentioned earlier, these kinds of local networks may be really important. Um, but I don't think that there's necessarily a future that's written yet, and so that's up to us, right? We have to take that responsibility very seriously. And um, I guess my optimistic note is uh, is that I do think we have some some power to affect those kinds of futures. Individual poll. Yeah, I mean, showing up to a march, showing up to vote, showing up to participate in democracy is probably the strongest tool that we have to guard against a 1984 reality, right? Yeah. 
Okay, that's the end of our panel. So hopefully this short talk uh, helps you to navigate in the ocean of data because at the end of the day, it's your responsibility to, uh, to identify fake news from, from real news. And as just Emily said, to participate in democracy using great power that you have in your pocket. Just remember this is a thousand times more powerful than Cray supercomputer 40 years ago. With this massive power, each individual can make a great deal of difference. Thank you. Thank you all so much, that was, that was great. Um, our last panel of the day, and thanks to all of you for being here, um, a special thanks to everyone from the foundation who's done so much behind the scenes to make this day happen. Um, our last panel is actually gonna, I think, help leave us on an optimistic note. Um, we've heard a lot about isolation, filter bubbles, fake news, disinformation. Um, we've heard about how technology can be used to isolate us. Um, but what we're about to learn about is a way that technology can connect us um, and a way that um, technology can give voices in democracy to those who often go unheard. Um, so I'd like to welcome our final panel, uh, Disrupting Polarization, New Forums for Dialogue to the Stage. Uh, Brian Dorries, who's the Artistic Director of the Theater of War, will moderate this panel. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. Um, my name is Brian Dorries. I'm the Artistic Director of Theater of War Productions, and we're going to do this last one a little differently than the others. Um, so I'd like to ask you to put away your devices, I mean, not in a fascist kind of way. If, we'll just know that if you're looking at your device, you're probably checking your email or reading the newspaper, because we're not going to use them for questions. We're actually going to do something really novel, which is I'm going to come out to you, and <laughs> we're going to hear your voices. So um, in the ancient world, um, just down the street from the Agora uh, was, which was the gathering place, was uh, the Theatron, the Amphitheatron, the Theater of Dionysus. I'm sure many of you have been there, and if you haven't, and you have, this is your first time to Greece, I hope you will go, because I think it's relevant to this conversation we're about to have right now, which is to say that while the Agora, obviously, is the name of this institute, and is the reason we've come together to talk, the theater, the ancient theater, was a technology designed to disrupt hierarchy and also to dissolve boundaries. And I would suggest just a few framing thoughts before we get down to our discussion, because we're going to try to end exactly on time at one o'clock, um, that the word amphitheatron, amphitheater, means I see you, you see me. We see in two directions. And um, this, the theater was a place of seeing and being seen, of seeing an actor perform and actually be, being seen watching the actor perform by everyone in an amphitheatrical setting, as we are looking at you with the house lights at least at 50% right now. And um, so I would contend that the theater was a, a technology as um, refined, and as sophisticated as um, the technology that Mr. Kasparov just raised at the end of his closing remarks. Um, and that the god of theater in ancient Greece was Dionysus, Dionysos, who was the god of boundary disillusion, the god that dissolved the boundaries between individuals and even communities. Now we can talk about hierarchy and how that relates to boundary dissolution of individuals, and I think we will in our, our discussion. Um, but that's the framework from which I want to move to um, the technology we're going to be talking about today, which is a technology I tried yesterday for the first time. And um, as I stepped inside it, uh, just around the corner from here, behind the Agora Cafe, uh, in a gold space, um, I stepped into a seemingly boundaryless experience 
and into a dark room in which I spoke to two men who were sitting in Afghanistan, speaking back to me. And I could just say for myself, having that experience for the first time, that the experience was like stepping across. The only thing I could liken it to was when um, my company, my theater company, performed in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. And we went to the border fence at the American base. And there's a line painted on the ground. And on one side, it's the United States. And the other side, it's Cuba. And one can stand with a foot on either side. And it felt like I had a foot on either side. I was in neither and both for that brief interaction uh, with those two men from Afghanistan. And I'll leave it at that, but to me, the really fertile ground of this discussion will revolve around how technology can help us to dissolve boundaries that prohibit us from hearing each other because the theater, in addition to being the seeing place, the teatron, the place where one is seen, if you've ever been to an ancient amphitheater, you know that the acoustics are perfect. And if you've been to Epidaurus, which is mostly intact, you know that you can hear people on the other side of the space with the clarity of Bose noise-canceling headphones. And with that clarity of sight and sound, something new is possible. Something new can happen. Um, with the disruptive power of a technology designed to bring us together in a different way than the Agora brings people together. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna turn things over to our panelists um, who are gonna set up a, a, a brief introduction to their work, both with the technology that Amar has developed, and I'll let him introduce himself. I'd love for you all to say who you are as well. And people can read, obviously, but you can speak um, to who you are and as it pertains to your introduction, if that's okay. And after their introduction, which will involve some video, which Amar is going to set up as he talks about the work and also some research, then I'm going to come out to you with um, a couple of microphones and we're going to turn this place into a seeing and hearing place at the end of the day. And we're going to see and hear from each other. You know, this event was set up as a culture of experts talking from the stage, and that's one hierarchy. And I know the audience was discussed as experts as well. I just like to offer that I feel like we know this particular session is working when someone who doesn't necessarily consider himself or herself an expert feels empowered to speak, and I hope that will happen in our discussion. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Amar. I know who's gonna set up both a description of portals and the portal technology, and also to his colleagues, Tracy and Veshla, who are gonna talk about a little bit about their research. Shall we skip over me because I'm cheating and having Please. a video speak for me so I can be as eloquent as all of you. So why don't I go last? No? All right. I think, okay. they, I think I need to have the experience before we hear the research, if that's okay with you. Oh, oh, I get it. Yes, okay, yes, fine. Yes, yes. So, uh, I'm, Affect uh, before uh, intellect. This understood. Time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. All right. I'm Amar Bakshi. Uh, I've founded Shared Studios, and we have a network of portals, gold spaces around the world. As I just mentioned, I'm offloading the rest of the description to a pre-recorded message, which means I won't flub it. So Terrific. Let's turn things over to our pre-recorded description. Portals is about really curating the diversity of the world and bringing the benefits of that diversity to people from all walks of life. I'm Amar Bakshi. I'm the founder and creator of Shared Studios. We take shipping containers, we paint them gold, and we equip them with immersive audio-visual technology. We're in a world where people are retreating into their own little bubbles. They see and hear things that are given to them, but don't often get the chance to talk to someone halfway around the world or talk to someone who they hear about all the time. Through portals, you can connect with people that you're separated from due to distance and really learn about their realities in a very simple way, through a simple conversation. We have 30 portals around the world, and every portal connects to every other portal in the network. When you enter one, you come face to face with someone in an identical portal somewhere else on Earth and can converse live, full body, as if in the same room. When people come in, they often describe feeling as though they're breathing the same air. Kids think they can walk up through the wall and hug the person on the other end. Being in the Portal Project has kind of changed my life. I think it's just starting world peace. It's as diverse as our sites are, from a refugee camp in Erbil, Iraq. It gave us a lot of information about how's the life, how's the situation. To a tech hub in Gaza City, Palestine. 
this. And yeah, then we're gonna eat. To a modern art museum in Mexico City. No matter how far away we are, we can still be brothers and sisters. Our portal in Kigali, Rwanda, is at a community art space. I think this is an awesome opportunity to connect Rwanda to the rest of the world. And we just launched a portal in Times Square. And every day, we have everything from strangers talking about daily life, to ongoing classes, to global performances, dance-offs, rap albums, and to sharing entrepreneurial ideas. We could bend the spaces and create this wonderful experience uh, to connect to people in different parts of the world. We had President Obama come and speak to social entrepreneurs in South Korea, Iraq, the UK, and Mexico. It's an amazing technology, making it seem like you're standing right in front of me. We've now had 75,000 people come through and have these conversations. And they all talk about how powerful it is to focus your attention on hearing the stories of someone else. We want this to happen all over the world for everybody. Any location can really be a portal as long as it has internet and a source of electricity. No matter where you are, who you are, we want to hear from you and we want to work with you to put a portal in your community. Because with every new site, we grow more diverse, more dynamic, and ever more valuable together. All right. So, uh, shall I briefly? Yeah, please. Okay. Lead us in. So we now have uh, about 40 portals around the world staffed by 60 portal curators whose job it is to open that portal every day, to encourage their community to participate, and one of those curators is here with us today. Uh, just briefly, our vision is really to create a network of these permanently around the world, uh, analogous to a library. And with a library, it's not just a librarian mechanically getting you a book to match your discrete interest. The librarian is also trying to excite you about engaging human knowledge itself. And I and we similarly think about portals and our curators as encouraging people from all walks of life to seek to take advantage of human diversity uh, as well. So our vision is one day to have perhaps 10,000 of these around the world all staffed by human beings whose job it is to do exactly this. Now, we have a portal outside, and it's connected to all of our sites around the world, um, thanks to SNF Agora and Hopkins for bringing us. And in fact, the person who is curating it on this end is uh, Omid Habibi, who's here with us, and actually is the reason we have a permanent portal network in the first place. Uh, originally, we set up a portal between Tehran and New York as an art piece, and people came in and had moving experiences, but we didn't necessarily anticipate it would grow. Omid reached out, having heard about it on BBC Persia, and said, I'd like to bring a portal to Herat, Afghanistan, for two main reasons. One, when people think about us, they think Taliban, or outsourced labor. And two, we would like to showcase and engage and learn from the world. So show ourselves, be heard, and then listen. And so he found a, gold, a shipping container, painted it gold, set it down in Herat University, pulled together all the local leaders from various tribes for an event so they felt collective ownership of this new item, and then socialized it so that it now has been running there for more than three years. Now, there are just three quick anecdotes from that portal in particular will maybe set the stage for uh, what we're going to talk about. One of the things that happened in it was that men or women who normally don't spend time alone in the same room in Afghanistan, entered the portal and were alone in the same room, quote unquote, as someone in another site, somewhere else on earth. And of course, it's not the same room, it's a, you are separated by distance, and there is this space with new norms of behavior and codes and assumptions that we are creating together. Second, we had a drone pilot in Washington, D.C. come in and speak to uh, someone in Herat, Afghanistan. The drone pilot knew the geography of Afghanistan extraordinarily well, extraordinarily well, and yet had never had a conversation with an Afghan. And similarly, people who did often came in with a particular purpose in mind or goal for the interaction, never just to come to know the other. And the final thing that I think is relevant here 
is that we also have a portal, one of our portals is in inner city Milwaukee in a community with the highest black male incarceration rate in America. One of the things it grapples with is gun violence. And our curator there, who has also been with us for a number of years, organized local gang leaders to come to the portal to converse with people, tribal leaders in Herat, Afghanistan, about how they sought to make peace between diverse and rival groups. Our curator calls this portal life, which is the idea that no matter what you're doing, whether you're playing, working, relaxing, you can do it at least as well, if not better, by engaging across distance and difference, and that can be done both globally and in our divided cities here at home. So, final note, um, you know, there are immense benefits to our interconnected age and to technology and to human diversity, but often those benefits do not extend to everyone. We are fortunate to be able to fly, to be here, to be part of multinational institutions with global connections, but for the vast majority of people who rarely leave a relatively small geography, the benefits of this are not, are not uh, there. And yet there's a tremendous amount that can be done by harnessing it and tethering technology to communities and a common purpose. Terrific, thank you so much, Amar. Um, our next two speakers, I think, are gonna tag team this portion of our, uh, our discussion. And then, and then shortly after their brief opening remarks, we're gonna come straight out to you and we're gonna move back and forth between these two places, yeah. Well, first, let me say thank you to the foundation and to the folks at Yale who, who brought us out here to share in this, uh, uh, Johns Hopkins, did I just say? That is jet lag right there. Uh, to share in this experience um, and to share this technology with you. Um, I wanted to begin by doing a little one woman show uh, to show you that uh, what happens inside the portals, uh, what happens when people from different geographies uh, engage in, in civil discourse. They're in the middle of a disagreement they're in a disagreement about policing and the role of the state in their lives. One says, well, as I said again, don't say you don't like the police because some police are, it's just like saying a woman did something to you and you hate all women. No, it's not the same thing. The other person says, nah, nah, no it ain't. It's not the same thing. If I get pulled over for speed walking, the police is not my friend. Do you understand that? Anytime I get pulled over and I didn't have no brake lights out and you tell me the brake light out, the police is not my friend. So you know the police can be your friend, but they're not mine. I've been arrested over a dozen times, so they're not my friend. But I do respect the police. You know I don't like them, but I do respect them. I gotta get out their way, because I know the consequences behind going up against them. They don't aim for the lower part of your body to slow you down or injure you, they aim for your head. To which his interlocutor says, do you know they are also scared? They are human. Do you know that they are also scared? One police told me the reason they must get worried now, they have people in the street who have better guns. I haven't really seen a brother get the righteous trial since the police killed them, not one, not one. It took for the officer to rape somebody for this brother to get his peace, to get his rest in peace. It ain't no peace if you ain't getting just, justice behind your murder. The police is not right. This is not right, man. All these brothers getting shot for free. Do you think that's right in any t type of form, shape, or fashion? To which his partner says, no, no, no way, man, I know. I know all about this sea, but as I said, my only thing is I'm not gonna blame the whole nation for a couple people, so that's what I'm saying. To which his partner says, the whole nation need to be blamed because the nation upholding it. You should target the people who are messing up the name of the police because they police is not supposed to be unrighteous. And the man in Milwaukee says, I'm not saying that the police is the only people that's wrong in this. I'm saying black on black crime is wrong, period. White on black crime is period two. Police on black crime is period two. You see what I'm saying? All of it wrong. But what I'm saying is when you try to uphold the polices that's doing so much bogus stuff out here and getting away with it, you gonna bite into a rotten apple? You telling me if one part of the apple is nasty, you gonna eat the other side? If they got one seed in the department that's bad, now it's growing vines. And then the other man goes on to say, no, I can't judge the whole department based on a few uh, bad actors. The other man says, that's what I'm talking about. They have to accept their friends, police, who are doing the stuff that they did not themselves do. They got a code that they live by. And finally, 
the Milwaukee man says, right, like you said, it's bad for them. So what does that make them? That makes them a gang. That makes them a legalized gang. Now, the conversation goes on, and they end at a point of consensus, and they say, I appreciate you. I appreciate hearing your story. I've learned something from you. So at first, it seems that they are having a vehement disagreement. They're a thousand miles apart, and they're debating in this room. The, the conversation gets heated at some point. But they also share jokes. They laugh together. At one point, they recite lyrics to a poem. And another point, they tell their own traumatic stories of police violence and firsthand experiences with the state. They share moments of yearning. They share their innermost aspirations. They share their political desires. They share in political morality. You would hear, if I went on to read the entire conversation, that they both had interesting ideas for disrupting hegemony. Both demanded black liberation. And most of all, you would hear them come to a point of shared meaning and connection through radical disagreement. In all their discord and complexity, you would hear political discourse and vital ideas to understanding and reviving democracy in our time. And while they were strangers and unknown to one another, their stories pulled on a cord through our intergenerational black memories. They each stood inside a chamber that you just saw in the video, separated by distance, but united in the, the fact that this space was one not to ship goods, it's a shipping container, yes, but meant to ship our ideas, our aspirations, our freedom dreams. And instead of isolation from one another, instead of confinement, indeed, the shipping container does mimic the cell that both of these men had inhabited at one point in time. Instead, it was meant to liberate, to connect, and to amplify the testimony of what Tracy and I call race-class subjugated communities. And after that pair left the gold virtual front porch, a young woman entered, and she spoke to another woman, a mother, and they shared ideas about what motherhood meant in this time of high police violence against their young children. One says, you can't even raise your children properly, you know, with someone else, the police, trying to be their dad. I mean, you're not even part of, a fam of my family. How are, you, how are you providing for me? And the woman she's speaking to says, how are you even being supported? I can't even get you to come to my neighborhood if somebody gets shot. But for our stolen car, you can. You can do 70 and 80 miles per hour down a one-way street, and all these children are playing on it. And as they left, over the course of the next year and a half, in partnership with Shared Studios and Amar and the curators that you saw in the video, Tracy Mears and I paired up to amass the largest collection to date of first-hand experiences of highly policed communities. They took in one another's accounts. They bore witness. And they tell us something that I want to leave you with today, which is that we, this conference is premised, is anchored around the idea that polarization and fraying civic discourse and fraying democratic institutions and pitched inequalities are really a new thing that we must address. And yet, these folks inside the portals and in our research have been telling us that democracy has never been well in their communities, that it has always a limited project, that it has always been an unreconstructed democracy. One of the radical ideas of this technology, of the portal, is that it offers them the keystone to a functioning democratic order, and that is voice. That is the right to be heard. The famous democratic theorist Robert Dahl once said, that political equality is premised on the notion of an equal distance of citizens to their government, of the ability of all citizens' voices to register in the halls of power. And that's how I see the portals. It's a radical experiment in listening, not just as a research methodology, it is that too, but as a political virtue. 
I'll end there, and, and you, Tracy will talk more about uh, that last point. Thank you. I'm Tracy Mears. Um, I teach at Yale Law School, and I also am the director of the Justice Collaboratory. Just a moment on that. The Justice Collaboratory does work trying to understand how people relate to legal authorities and how they understand the fairness of them. And this project that brought Veshla and Amar and I together, I was motivated to do that primarily through that lens, trying to capture the narratives of people who experience both problems of crime in their community and then the policies that legal authorities usually impose on them um, to address those, those problems. And as you've heard most evocatively um, from Veshla, um, the people who are experiencing both of these issues understand both crime and the policies designed to address them in incredibly complex ways. And one of the things that we wanted to do through this project, in addition to critique the usual ways of understanding those narratives, let me just say briefly, the usual way to do that is through collection of public opinion data where we as researchers interact with respondents in very highly constructed one-on-one -on -one ways. One thing you can say about that is that it's neither public nor opinion. Um, and what we wanted to do was actually create um, a real public opinion through um, Amar's brilliant portals idea. So that's one thing. But we realized very quickly that by centering these voices and making them the focus of what we needed to listen to, was that we could actually give meaning to Lonnie Guineer and Gerald Torres's work who wrote in the Miner's Canary that issues of race in the United States often point to underlying problems that affect all Americans, echoing what Veshla just said about the problems in democracy being universal, longstanding, a through line of the ways in which those who are dispossessed, stateless, in our own work we have called them, um, the unfree, have not really been able to participate in democracy. So we think that by using the portals, it's an opportunity to center those voices and to allow folks to work together to assert their own agency to come up with strategies to address the problems um, that they face. And that's our, that's our vision, um, to democratize, democratize access to technology, not so much to connect disparate voices or different voices, but to connect those together who are in isolation to amplify um, their own voices. And I think I'll just end with that. Thank you so much. I'd love to thank our three uh, speakers with a big round of applause for getting us started. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go out in the audience and, and we're going to field some thoughts and questions. Before I do, I just want to say I'm so inspired by what you all are doing. And I know speaking before we spoke, before we came up, um, we talked about how this project started kind of as an art project in a cultural space with no agenda. So you would go into these spaces and it wasn't like there was a legislated set of questions you had to ask or, uh, you know, an exercise. It was just about a human confrontation, a, a coming together across very uh, vast distances and and locales. But what I love most about the application of social science to this technology and what you all are doing um, beyond the brilliance of this technology is, um, you know, a recentering of the question, which I personally don't hear coming from social science as often as I would like, which is, you know, who is in the position to actually tell us what the solutions are to the problems that these specific communities face? A culture of experts? or people with skin in the game who are living these experiences every day. And I feel like it's a, it's, it shouldn't be a radical proposition, but it feels like one in our world today, which leads me to where I wanted to head, and I promise we're gonna involve you all, but I, want, I also promised that we wanted to involve the audience in the short time that we had. Um, so I wanna just read to you all two statements really briefly, and they're in your program. Uh, this is a description of uh, the Agora Institute in the first page, it says, um, uh, the purpose of the Agora Institute is to introduce a type of work the Institute will be undertaking from exploring the decline of modern dialogue and decision making to sharing lessons on promoting open discussion to proposing innovative reforms to reverse the corrosive deterioration 
of norms. Um, now, we've certainly talked in other sessions about the deterioration of norms and how corrosive those can be, but in the context of this discussion, perhaps it's the norms that are inhibiting the very populations that are trying to be served with this technology and this, and this work that Tracy and Vessel are doing. It's very norms that perhaps get in the way of empowering those communities to speak and be heard, even by each other, I would like to put forward. So in, in uh, Amar's description of his work, he says um, uh, the, the purpose of the technology is to bring it into environments across pronounced distances to create new forms of uh, digital, physical, public spaces that challenge and subvert existing norms. So there seems to be a tension between these two ideas that we've come together to sort of reinstate civil discourse and to bolster the exchange of ideas and dialogue, and on the other hand, that perhaps the, if not corrosion or the erosion of norms, but the subversion of them may be necessary for it to be an inclusive conversation uh, across democracies. And perhaps democracy isn't even the form that that kind of inclusion necessarily will ever take. And so with that, I just want to jump out into the audience, and I have a second mic runner who happens to be my um, colleague from Theater of War Productions, and sometimes seven nights a week we're running mics and audiences, so she's very expert. I have a hand already here, and I'm going to come to him. But the question was simply, um, given the tension between those two statements, um, you know, can you all as an audience speak, reflect, question uh, with regard to um, the relationship between norms and this technology that you've now seen demonstrated and how it might open up new avenues of discord. Brian, you talked about theater as being a technology and then you talked about the portal be a technology as well. And the obvious connection here is that they're both means of communication and so the end result is the one that matters, uh, allowing people to communicate. So we can keep going down the road in this way. We keep inventing new technologies that allow people to communicate. And at what point we begin a conversation about the technology itself? At what point are we beginning to looking at these technologies and the different impact they have and the different modes of communication that they allow us to engage into? And uh, because a lot of people are talking about technologies themselves and how they allow different modes of communication and how communicating through theater is a completely different thing, perhaps, than communicating through a portal. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, I'm going to pivot and say to okay. Amar and to Tracy and Veshla, um, I know you created this technology and devised this work around the premise that so many of our technologies isolate us, and this is a deliberate use of a technology to bring people together. And I wonder if you could speak to how it works, but also how you've seen it working sure. in terms of bringing people together in novel ways. Yeah, yeah so just, uh, obviously none of these technologies exist outside of contexts and you know, conventional use cases. So much of our technology, and when we use that term, so much of it today is run by relatively few gigantic companies that target us as individual consumers of technology. Portals is very much about something Deb said earlier caught my ear about a physical location in a public site that's staffed by a human being that cannot scale but with human beings. And so technology is one term to use in relation to it, but I think there are many others. Uh, you know, all that said, uh, what I think we are, Shared Studios, is about a network of human curators who are interconnected in this common project. And the technology, the fact that it's full body, immersive, that you feel like they're right in front of you, you know, that has some import uh, relative to a phone call. It has a difference, and that can be studied by any number of modalities. Uh, but that itself is going to continue to change. And what we hope we can do is assert some agency over the deployment of these technologies. And like I was mentioning with gender in Afghanistan or whatever else, construct norms for a space and for a technology, not in the context of how am I using it as an individual consumer. Because you can imagine, you know, endless numbers of uses that are but how do we use it and deploy it first and foremost in the context of communities? I have a slightly different uh, take, not in disagreement, but um, as a social scientist, uh, we were really bowled over uh, by the radical potential of portals as, of this immersive technology. 
um, to, to kind of reimagine and upend the way we traditionally conceive of doing research. Um, so I'll give you an example. The people that I quoted at the beginning of my uh, short remarks, um, we have a short survey before people enter the, the gold box when we ask them, how do, you, how do you feel about police in your community? And then we ask them to dialogue for, for 20 or 30 minutes. Um, and, and on the, the written iPad survey that we give them, there's a question that says, do you, how much do you trust police? Sometimes, all the time, never, that kind of thing, a five-point Likert scale. And the two people I began with both said sometimes to that answer. And I give you that example because the normal way we do public opinion research, the normal way we understand the political ideas of, of Americans, of global citizens, is to ask them questions like that, five-point questions that actually reveal very little about lived experience, about how people reason together, about how they disagree, about where they feel uh, uncommitted to a particular view. And it's through discourse, it's through these 30 minute uh, uh, um, ideas sharing moments that we get beyond snapshots of public opinion in very isolated, apolitical settings. And one of the things Tracy and I were uh, kind of shocked by is how readily people wanted the chance to engage one another. How, how, how infrequently they would say to us and write down in the gold book outside the portal things like, nobody's ever asked me what I thought or what my experience with police was. Thank you for asking. Thank you for listening. Um, and so we, we conceive of this as a way to, to advance research and to have a more complex uh, view of what the public, the citizenry, thinks about governance, about their own citizenship, about how much they trust uh, the government and, and not, rather than just collecting it in these very isolated uh, snapshots, that we really wanted to move towards me listening to you, you hearing my thoughts, and then how we create shared meaning out of that moment. Tracy, do you want to speak to that? I'm yeah. I, w I don't, I do. But I know we have uh, so, probably so many other people to say something, but I do want to just say one thing. The reason why those of you might be wondering why um, Veshla read the responses rather than giving you uh, a, a, a video, because we did record them and we have them, but because it's research, the Institutional Review Board, and the scholars in the audience know this, um, we can't actually show you what they look like and who they are. We're, we're obligated to anonymize that. And what's interesting about IRB is that they're always thinking about risks. And we had to think of the ways in which people might be harmed by having this particular interaction. And one of the things we said was, well, in talking about your interactions with police and how legal authorities have failed you, you might recall negative experiences, it might be traumatic. And almost without fail, we've seen in the testimonies that people give in the gold book, which comes after the portal experience, you write down what you um, felt, what your interaction was like in a gold book with a gold pen. People say uniformly positive things, um, that it's cathartic, that it was liberating, that it was tr a release, it was transformative. Um, and I think that's part of this experience, too, uh, when we are thinking about the potential for this technology to improve democracy. It's really, well, Liz, you're making, I'm going to hold on, but yeah, there are people over here, and Marjolaine, if you wouldn't mind coming to the center, because we don't want to um, deprive folks, uh, and sorry if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, unfortunately, we need a boom mic in this space in the short time that we have. Um, yeah, go right ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my name is John Howard. I'm a librarian at University College Dublin. And I find it interesting today we've been talking about polarization and themes of trust. We haven't used the word reconciliation mm. in talking about how we resolve polarization. And we haven't talked much about culture. But what I'd like to assert, Amar, is that what you have done is created a cultural institution that people are able to trust and enables them to tell their story. And I think the broader message here is that cultural institutions 
are inherently trusted organizations within society and have a potentially enormous role to play uh, in this whole issue of polarization and of reconciliation. I'm from the Republic of Ireland and on the island of Ireland we know a great deal about polarization and we work very hard towards reconciliation. One of the organizations I am responsible for, the National Folklore Collection, uses its role as a trusted national organization to try to catalyze reconciliation with the travelers, communities, with religious conflict, with the kind of organized repression and abuse that uh, is attributed to the government of Ireland, to the Catholic Church and other things. I think that is an important message for everyone here that we need to reflect not just on the role of universities, political organizations and so forth, but also on the potentially powerful role that cultural organizations have to play in this area. Thank you so much, sir. I really appreciate everything That's you That's absolutely said. the case. Um, our curators, the 60 of them now, interact daily. We have about 50 connections a week. And so what that means is from Gaza to Milwaukee and Kigali to Yangon and on and on and on with every site connecting to every other site, they come to know one another and are part of this shared undertaking. One other thing I would just note is people have reached out, you know, thousands from around the world from really diverse political persuasions from we're in one of the most conservative districts in the United States uh, to Gaza to you name it. And um, there is a... Uh, there is something that I think people across divides share, which is, if nurtured, a basic curiosity in the life of other people and how it's lived. Uh, I think that we suppress that and it's awkward and it's uncomfortable, but if, if given a space, people are eager, I feel, to, to share this. And, uh, you know, the cultural institutions piece is quite important and a contemporary definition of art is quite helpful here in discussing an environment where people come without a particular purpose in mind or without the institutional frameworks we're used to, which underlie, you know, we're not selling you ads, we're not charging you money, we're not recording your conversations, we're not, there are many things that we do that make this distinct from other platforms. And that, I think, gives it a level of trust and allows people to speak. But also, because of this dif difference in distance, people come in and they, and you, as we were walking, Veshla gave just, a, I think, the best summation of this, so I might just pass it to you, but I, I was calling it disinterested engagements, but I think there's a better way of putting it that allows for people to have very authentic dialogues that they find vanishingly rare otherwise. So most people assume that you reveal your most, in, you open yourself up you reveal your most intimate details and stories and lived experience to people uh, that you know very well that are in your family and social networks. And there's been a good deal of research by sociologists to show that that's actually not the case. Um, that when you encounter sometimes a perfect stranger but not a random stranger, so these are communities that know that they share a particular experience being highly surveilled by the state. When you encounter a perfect stranger, and there's no basis for past baggage or past distrust or future expectation of gain, right? You will never see the person again in your life. People actually reveal and open themselves up to uh, really uh, incredible engagements. They share traumas that they've never shared with, with other members of their own family. Um, and that leads to the kind of release that many of them speak about uh, in coming out of the portal. We have time for one more uh, question or comment that hopefully will be succinct. And I see your hand over here. Oh, I, I, I'm, 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 oh, someone already has the microphone, so unfortunately, you're gonna have to sum up everyone's thoughts. But before you do that, I just wanna say one thing, which is that I really appreciate uh, the librarian gentleman from Ireland, what you said about culture, and I think it connects to what we were saying a second ago about technology, that when technology and culture are transactional, right. a hierarchy is imposed that actually excludes a tremendous, and that's why I love about this festival here in Athens, that it's free and open to the public, but you know, in New York with our company, my company, how do we get um, uh, communities of color, uh, communities that have been over-policed, communities that have experienced 
uh, racialized violence across the threshold of, of cultural spaces to actually engage when that transactional hierarchy is firmly in place and many people feel these spaces aren't for them. How do we get them even if the events are free? It's something that I think about all the time and I feel like this technology speaks to that, this, or this, the portals speak to that. Um, you have the mic, sir. No pressure because you're going to have the last word before lunch. We're going to riff on it. Yeah, but, uh, I don't yeah. think I can sum up everyone's thoughts on my question because it's something really specific. Uh, so maybe I should pass the no, mic. It's okay. No, please. I'm just joking. Go right ahead. <laughs> okay, then. So uh, speaking about new technologies, uh, first of all, I'm Petros. I'm uh, doing an internship for the Stavros Narcos Foundation. Um, speaking about technology and new use of media, um, I would like to bring the focus to the use of video games and interactive media. Um, video games have evolved and they are powerful in a way that they have shifted the um, focus from the message we give to the person, like they have differentiated themselves from being a movie or being a book. We don't tell a story, we let the, story, the, we let the player create his own story and his own narrative. Um, Sony Entertainment has been releasing titles over time, we're working closely with David Cates, and where the player has to go through a story and take important decisions. He has to make choices which affect the, how the story progresses. So you have branching storylines and different narratives, and uh, these decisions and choices can be seen and measured in the end in a database. So right, right now, we have not only the opportunity to measure or uh, see how a person thinks, but we can measure how a person would react or what kind of choice he would take given a, a, given a situation where he can have this kind of choice. So do you think this is a, more, is a better way, a more advanced way to see how people think and act and what are their thoughts on um, and why there is polarization in this sense? Do you think that it's a better way than dialogue? It's a new form of dialogue maybe. I'm ha you know, uh, it, I have some quick, you know, W, it, it, it's an interesting time to bring up games, right? Because WHO just released, just labeled game addiction, you know, as a, a credible disorder. And we know that video game makers are using incredible algorithms to literally play on our dopamine receptors so that we become fully addicted. Now, I know that's not the video game you're describing, but I think that, you know, intermediation with uh, AI and with algorithms presupposes, you know, it, it switches it. it. It basically becomes the machine knowing us as opposed to us knowing ourselves and imagining our future. And I think that can be profoundly disempowering. And I think a lot of interventions these days get very excited about smart cities and big data, but what that really means is let us see our people as units of analysis that we can then optimize. And I would say that we need soulful cities, that, that the crisis we face is not one of efficiency, it is one of meaning. And so if you are not in an authentic dialogue with another human being, you cannot even come to know your full self. And without constructing meaning with another human being, uh, we cannot have democratic re societies or self-governing societies of really any kind. So I have a quick thought on that too, which is a riff off of what um, Amar just said, which is often, you know, I think I have a 12 year old son and he spends a lot of time playing video games. And another way of understanding what um, Amar was talking about is that there's an interaction between the game maker and my son and thinking about what choices he will make and what choices others like him will make without necessarily thinking about crea creating um, horizontal connections and the creation of um, a public good as opposed to maximizing uh, individual uh, utilities. And what we're trying to do, I think, is to think about this technology in a horizontal way uh, rather than a vertical way. When you think about um, strategies to solve the problems that the people that we're most focused on face, we're not necessarily thinking about the best way to deploy expert knowledge to those places where those people live, but instead maximizing the ways in which those individuals have their own expert knowledge, collecting them, amplifying them, and pushing it up. I mean, literally up because of the hierarchies in which we all live. Um, and so 
that isn't maybe necessarily responsive to exactly what you are asking when you say, is this a better way? I think it's just a fundamentally different way. I want to polarize using, you know, the technical term of polarize, um, you know, polarize our vision here and thinking about the problem. I think Tracy got that absolutely right. I don't have much to say about uh, video games per se, um, but one thing I wanted to leave you with is that this uh, technology and our larger aim isn't just about connecting people. It's also about hearing their causal story of democracy take shape. And when you listen, and when you listen well, what you will hear is that what we normally, as, as academics who study uh, power and citizenship uh, and trust in legal authorities, is not what we conventionally understand the, the real, you know, blights to democracy to be. What you hear is that they don't want a tighter connection to government. They don't want government more present in their lives. They want uh, a, a different way of government intervening uh, in their lives. And, and so our larger aim is to actually really try to re-theorize from, you know, we, we call it democracy from below, from the bottom. And it is from the bottom that we can really understand some of the threats that we now face um, and get creative solutions to, to what would bring uh, liberation of our most dis dispossessed and stateless and unfree. Thank you so much. You know, I'm just struck by, we could be talking for many hours. I want to, beyond this, I want to encourage everyone, even before you go to lunch, I presume the portal will be open. Uh, no, okay. What's that? This evening, please come back. Please come to our performance tonight of the Drum Major Instinct, but also please come back and um, experience the portal and, uh, and then continue the conversation, not just with everyone in this room, but with people across the planet. I mean, one of the things I found myself doing in the portal yesterday was talking about the technology, you know, as I was experiencing it with two other people in another country. So this conversation can continue in all kinds of really exciting ways. One of the things I'm most inspired by, in terms of both, all three of your work, is the creation of a space in which the meaning is legislated by the individuals in it, a space that has capacious room for the infinite possibility of interpretation. And I would say that's a striking difference from designed video games, as we were talking about it before, and other media, and even cultural experiences. And so it's a really powerful distinction to make, and I'm glad the question was raised about video games because it further distinguishes the design, the, the, the purposeful design of both the technology but also the research that you all are doing. I just want to thank you all for kicking off a really productive and exciting conversation and we look forward to continuing it hopefully over the next few days. I want to thank you very much. Someone is to deliver closing remarks. I presume it's Elizabeth, so I'm going to pass it back to her. Okay. Um, I'll just say it from here. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks to all of our panelists um, and all of you for being here. Uh, lunch is being served upstairs in the lighthouse. Um, there'll be, as you exit, there'll be folks outside to take you there. Um, and I hope you'll continue the conversations that have begun in this room today um, over a wonderful meal here in Greece. Thank you. <laughs>